Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the In the Clinic podcast with Rob. And today we're getting into inversion thinking, how to make decisions, how to advance in your life, use inversion thinking. What does that mean? But also what coaching has taught me about success. So again, I, for those who don't know me, I'm Rob Sumner, owner of Sumner Specialized Physical Therapy and Specialized Strength. I do these podcasts really because I just enjoy helping people. I enjoy seeing people win in their life, in their injuries, in their fitness, in their mindset, anything. But overall, it's kind of my own cheaper way of doing therapy. <laughs> so let's get started. So inversion thinking. Um, this is something that I came across uh, in a podcast that I was listening to that really got into um, how to get the most or the best out of something. And it usually has to do with your own self self growth. So when you're looking at, um, you know, trying to improve your relationship, you're trying to improve uh, your fitness level, you can use inversion thinking by applying all the things that you shouldn't do. So if you want to get extremely fit, what are all the top 10 things that you shouldn't do to get fit, to, to not get fit, that is? So if I was trying not to get fit, what are all the 10 things I would do? Well. I wouldn't move very much. I I uh, would eat horribly and I'd eat as much as I want. I uh would drink a lot of alcohol. You know, so so right from there, the inversion thinking is this. Okay? If these are all the things that you should do, should not do, or if you wanted to get um really unhealthy, these are the things you should do. Now if you want to get healthy, just do the opposite of those. Okay, I should eat really quality food. I should monitor how much I eat and not eat in abundance. I should avoid alcohol. I should move more. So you see the purpose of inversion thinking. It really helps when you're when you're struggling with um, where to start. Well, instead of trying to decide where to go, just make a big list of what you shouldn't do, and then do the opposite. So let's apply that to coaching. So you know, I've I've coached for a lot of years from basketball, softball, other. And, uh, you know, I've got 15, 20 years of coaching experience in, and from that, you know, I've seen a lot of athletes, a lot of personalities all the way from as young as uh, seven years old, all the way up into 18. You know, when you start looking at all these demographics as a coach, you're able to start isolating certain traits, certain character traits, certain attitudes that allow for success in the sport, but also really helps with success in their life. So today I wanted to apply inversion thinking. Let's apply inversion thinking to, um, if I want to know the answer, what should athletes attitude or traits be to be the best athlete player that they can be? You want to find out what's what are actionable things that a player can do, become the best player possible. Let's use inversion thinking and say, well, what are the top 10 ways that players could become the worst player possible? Okay? And then we'll apply the inverse. So top 10 ways to become the worst player that you can <laughs> from a coaching perspective. All right, number one, if you were to become a really bad player and and a horrible player, number one, you would want all the glory and not do any of the work. So you would want all the praise, all the accolades, and all the success that comes from working really hard, but you wouldn't want to have to do the work. So you want that glory, but you don't want to have to do the work. Now, obviously, that doesn't make sense. You get what you work for. Um, but the mindset of, of wanting to, to, to have the glory but not put in the time, that is going to lead to a poor player. It really is. They can be a great athlete. They can have uh, you know, all the skills. But if they don't want to do the work, it catches up with them. And you see this in, in, even in professional sports. Great, great athletes, but they really don't want to work. And it catches up with them. 
So number one, they want the glory, but not the work. Number two, complaining instead of working hard. So if, if you wanted a really, really bad player, they would just complain all the time, but not want to put in the effort. And you see this. You have players that do this. They want to complain about everything under the sun. So-and-so is playing in front of them. They're playing in my position. Um, why am I not playing more? Um, why did the coach call this pitch? Why, uh, why can't I do this in practice? Why can't um, so-and-so play somewhere else so I can play where I want to play? Why can't I hit third instead of seven? The coaches stink. My teammates are, smell bad. Whatever. You hear it all the time with coaching. But a player that complains instead of just working hard, that's a good recipe for a poor player. Number three. Blaming others. Blaming others. Now, this is critical. Blaming others. I didn't strike out. The coach hasn't given me enough time and practice to be able to practice. I wouldn't have struck out, but the coach made me take a, take a pitch. You know, I, I'd be playing more, but my last name isn't. Johnson or whatever. Blaming others for the reason that you're not succeeding in your mind the way you want to, surefire away, be a pretty poor player. Pretty poor player. Number four, not being a team player. Not being a team player. So what does that mean? There's certain players that I've seen over time that will do what's asked of them from the team. If it helps the team, they're all for it. I can move a player from post to guard. Okay, coach. I can move a player from center field to third base. Okay, coach. A team player will do and play where it helps benefit the team. So to make a recipe for a poor player, a poor player is an individual that says, this is where I should be. I don't want to play anywhere else. I should be there. I'm better than so-and-so. I'm a much better player here than she is or he is. Blaming others. Sure fire away to become a really poor player. Number five, arrogance. <laughs> arrogance. So if we want a really poor player, we want an arrogant player. We want a player that's not willing to do the little things. We want a player that uh, wants to feel that they are not at the same level as their peers. So a poor player is one that says, I'm not going to shag balls. <laughs> How am I going to get better if I shag balls? It's about the team. Again, goes back to number four. Arrogance. I don't need to take extra reps. I already know this. I don't want to show so-and-so how to do this. That's beneath me. I don't want to hit sixth. I should be hitting third, second. Arrogance. I don't need to come in and get extra reps. I don't need to work in the off season. I'm already good enough. Arrogance. So a good way to become a poor player, arrogance. Number six, lack of self-awareness. Uh, surefire way to become a poor player. The lack of self-awareness of understanding your current abilities and where you need to go and where you need to improve and how you can improve those, it hurts. It hurts. Without the self-awareness to know what it's going to require or take to become an elite player or the player that even just plays as starts, it takes self-awareness to see that. So a poor player will have lack self-awareness. That will be a, a, a big character trait. Number seven, having others fight your battles for you, such as your parents. 
So a poor player is going to have an individual that won't ever talk to the other players or the coaches about any concerns that they have. A poor player is going to complain to their friends, complain to their parents, and have their friends and parents come and complain. But they're not a part of it. They don't want to be a part of it. But they want other people to fight their battles for them. They want the result of the confrontation without having to do the confrontation. So a poor player is going to have other people fight their battles for them instead of talking directly to the teammate or the coach about the situation that they have a concern with. Number eight, tearing down teammates. Always. A poor player is going to be a person that tears down teammates. And tearing down teammates can come in multiple ways. It can come in not just complaining in the dugout or on the bench or at practice about a certain teammate or how they're better than them or they should be playing more than them, but also at home. So tearing down your teammates to your parents who love you, support you, always will believe you no matter what. That when you tell them so-and-so is uh, not as good as you, they believe. When, they, when you tell them that you're not playing there because you don't have the right last name, they believe it. Which makes you a poor teammate. You're tearing them down. So number eight, ways, a way to become a poor, teammate, a poor player is to tear down your teammates. Number nine, not being coachable. Now, coachable comes in many forms. Um, I've had athletes that want to be coached and they will change anything they can, but mentally they can't apply it to outcome. They just can't change their body. But those aren't the ones that I'm talking about. In order to be a poor player, you're going to be a person that doesn't really want to change. You don't see the need. My dad told me to do it this way. My dad thinks you're stupid anyway, so I'm not listening to you. Poor coachability. Poor coachability is a way to become a poor player. For sure. And number 10, self-righteousness. So feeling vindicated in collecting people to your cause. You're upset that you're not starting. You're upset that you're not playing the position you are. You're upset that things aren't going how you saw them in your mind. So instead of applying the early ones of hard work and dedication and being a good teammate, it's I need to collect people to my cause. I need to tear down my other teammates. So-and-so shouldn't be there, don't you think? She's not as good as me. He's, he's terrible. Look how many errors he has. He can't even make a basket. Collecting people to your cause to get them on your side truly makes you a poor player. It has nothing to do with increasing your own value. It only decreases someone else's. And it's really hard to become a better player through subtraction than addition. You should not have to tear down somebody else's castle to build up your own. So again, we got 10 ways, inversion thinking, 10 ways to become an absolute poor player. You want the glory, not the work, complaining instead of working hard, blaming others, not being a good teammate, arrogant, lack of self-awareness, having others fight your battles for you, tearing down your teammates, not being coachable, and self-righteousness. So using inversion thinking, what should the opposite be? If you want to be an absolute fantastic player, what should you do? Well, you should want to work hard more than the glory. You should want to work hard instead of complain when things don't go your way. Instead of blaming others, you blame yourself. What can I do better? Because that's the only thing I can control is what I do, not anybody else. What can I do better that I'm currently not doing? What could I improve that I'm currently lacking at? Number four, be a good teammate. Be supportive. Even if you're not at the position you want, you still do it 100%. You work as hard as you can. 
to try and make the team better. Don't be arrogant. Have humility. The humility to do what's asked of you when it's needed and, and to continue to work on the little things and be a part of the team through leadership. Uh, fight your own batter, battles. When there's a confrontation or there's a, a conflict or a problem that you have that you're talking directly to your teammates in a kind, candorous way and in a kind, candorous way to your coaches to try and find some level of resolution. Lifting your teammates up. Great way to be a good teammate. Lift your teammates up. Be coachable. Try and and, and apply to 100% all the things that your coaches are asking you to do. And when you can't, ask questions. Ask, is there another way I can get the same result because this is challenging for me? Is there another way that you can talk to, talk in a different way that I might click for me because I'm not getting it? That's coachable. That's humility. And again, lack of self-righteousness. Lack of entitlement. So when you have a lack of entitlement, you expect nothing. You expect nothing. You just look to earn, earn, earn through the hard work and the dedication and being a good teammate. Whatever comes your way, you'll take it. But none of it's expected. So all in all, inversion thinking allows us to get our top 10 ways to become a great player. So if you're a player out there and you're wondering, how can I become a great player in the eyes of a coach? What are some ways that, that I can improve myself Every day, and some of these are just an attitude and mindset. They have nothing to do with the skill of the game. If you apply these every single day in your practices and games, I guarantee you, in time, you'll become a great player. You will. Because being a great player is more than the, the outcome on the field or outcome on the court. It comes down to everything. Attitude. The way that you lead your, your teammates. The way that you connect with them. How you inspire them the effort that you put into things, the seriousness that you dedicate yourself to the game. So all in all, again, we inversion thinking, we get to the top 10 ways to become a great player. Hopefully these helped you today. Again, my name is Rob Sumner, owner of Sumner Specialized Physical Therapy and Specialized Strength. I do these because I like these podcasts. It's my own form of therapy. And I hope that from these, you win just a little bit or a lot of it in your coaching in your plane, or in any other way, possibly mindset, or in your future jobs. All in all, thanks for listening. Hit subscribe, leave a comment, reach out to me if you want further discussion on this as well. Thank you for your time today.